what it was like to be in a really male-dominated, hyper-masculine work environment. It was very Wolf of Wall Street phenomenon called the glass lift where they elevate to the top very, very quickly. Every six minutes there's a police call that's made due to domestic or family violence. The, the Me Too movement, it polarises people on both sides of the equation. Where do you sit on the, the Me Too movement? This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business. But we do it from an immersive but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com ladies and gentlemen it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to unstoppable today we have lisa anise lisa thank you so much for joining us a pleasure thank you for having me now, the, a question I always like to ask our guests is: um, I look at your, I look at what you've done, I look at where you've been, and everything that you've been involved in, and there's it's it's a bit of a pedigree there. So I'm always curious as to people like you when you're at a dinner party or a barbecue, and someone says, "What do you do? How do you answer that, considering everything that you've done?" Uh, it depends. Yeah, that's a good question because <laughs> it's hard to define what I do. Um, yeah. unless you're, you work in the diversity and inclusion space. It depends on how much energy I have and um, reading the room. When I get into the back of a taxi and someone asks me, what do I do? I just give a very general response because I don't want to get into the politics of, um, of gender equality, for example. Um, I would normally tell someone I run a not-for-profit organisation that works to improve um, – equity and equitable outcomes for women and minority groups in the economy. That's beautiful. And um, as someone who I was brought up by a single mum and I've um, in many ways been an advocate uh, for single mums and I'm very pro um, supporting the, the, the equality aspect. But I'm curious as to how did you get into this space? Like what is it that brought you into this world? Because obviously this is a world that is becoming, uh, you know, uh, considerably more visible, you know, as we grow, as information and technology allows us to communicate more freely. But you've been involved in this for quite some time. I've always been motivated um, to – I've always been – someone with a heightened radar for fairness. I've just always been that way from when I was really small. And I've always, um, I found, I read a lot of books that introduced me to concepts around feminism um, when I was very young. And I didn't really understand where to put that energy because there were no clearly defined careers for people like me. I mean, you could take an activist path or you could take um, um, sort of a, a scholastic or an academic path. But um, I was always really focused on or really interested in workplace issues. I ended up starting a career in banking, which was really boring um, in institutional banking. And but that's a very male dominated area. Yes. Obviously. <laughs> it <was>. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah. And it was, look, I actually learned a lot from doing that because I got to experience what it was like to be um, in a really male dominated, hyper masculine, um, alpha kind of work environment. It was in the 90s and it was very Wolf of Wall Street. And I kind of saw firsthand just how hostile a work culture can be towards women. And I was really young at the time. I was a new grad. Um, but rather than be diminished by it, I sort of took it, saw it as an opportunity to um, try and change things. And initially I tried to change things from the inside. I put my hand up um, to volunteer to run training programs for all the traders on how not to sexually harass women and which was really naive thing to do 
<laughs> how not to sexually harass yeah, a woman. Yeah. The sex I don't mean to laugh because it's not. No, no, yeah, no. But the Sex Discrimination yeah. Act had been passed a decade earlier right. and companies, organisations were just starting to figure out what this meant for them. It was a risk yeah, right. for them. They didn't want to end up on the front page of the newspaper. Um, they didn't want massive lawsuits. They didn't really care about the equity component of it. But from a risk management perspective, it was really important. And the organisation I was with was looking for people to run the training. And I just went, yeah, I'll do it. And in the process of being someone who had very little power in an organisation, having to stand in front of um, groups of men who had lots of power, it was an interesting experience and I learned mm. a lot about what people are up against when they're trying to change the culture. Um, but suffice to say, it was formative in terms mm. of how I experienced that. And I, I, it motivated me to want to keep going because mm. I'm not someone who just, I will keep at it if someone sort of rejects the premise of equality and fairness in a workplace and that you're challenging the way things have always been done. And in those days, it was very much um, if as a woman you didn't find really degrading and sexist humour funny, then you were um, you couldn't take a joke, you didn't know how to lighten up, um, you weren't one of the team. Whereas actually we're able now to sort of step back and say, you know, what is funny is in the eye of the beholder. And if a whole group of people are saying this kind of behaviour makes me feel uncomfortable, awkward, it makes me feel highly visible and it makes me feel powerless, um, that sort of behaviour is not acceptable in the workplace. So, mm. and now we have the law to say it's not acceptable in a workplace. But it's look, it still goes on. The Human Rights mm. Commission um, will tell you that one in three women and one in four men experience workplace sexual harassment. And so, it hasn't. So it's one in three women and one in four men. Yeah, rough, yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. And usually, when men experience it, they experience it from other men or if they do experience it in a heterosexual context it's usually a, um, a one man versus a group of women who are making you know innuendos or jokes so it's you need a group of women to um, develop the kind of power imbalance that's usually at play in sexual harassment um, yeah. whereas in a normal work environment because men tend to dominate leadership positions men generally speaking, have more power in workplaces. And so, you know, um, sexual harassment and discrimination, when you whittle it away, it really does come down to power and a power imbalance. Yeah, right. I've only been in the workforce now 30 years, um, but in that time I've seen um, what I would call a significant shift in the dynamics, the relationship dynamics and the leadership dynamics of women going back like 30, 20, even 10, 15 years ago. Because I remember going back, you know, through my earlier career, I remember seeing women that were successful in many cases replicating male traits. You know, in most cases they were aggressive. In most cases they, were, they weren't what you'd classify a stereotypical feminine. They were just in, in many cases masculine women who were demonstrating the traits, what I'm assuming were, were seen in high-powered men in order to replicate their success and their power. But what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing a significant shift towards femininity in leadership, femininity in the workplace, femininity um, as, as what it is in, in its essence, which is quite powerful. Um, and it doesn't need to be adulterated with male characteristics and male traits. Is this something that you've witnessed yourself? And what do you think has been driving or giving women more permission to be more themselves and less trying to copy what they've seen in, in male behavior? It's a really, really good question and you've observed a really significant thing. Leadership has been defined since the beginning of workplaces in the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's been a really def narrow definition of what a leader is and, and, and leadership has been defined as being assertive, authoritarian, um, decisive, as you said, traits that are traditionally seen as masculine traits. The thing is, though, lots of men don't feel comfortable with those behaviours either. Mm. It, it's, there's just as many men who want to be collaborative and empathic and consultative as there are women, and there's just as many women who are natural um, authoritarian, difficult, you know, hard task, mask, 
working type of people. The difference is that we attribute certain behaviours to men and certain behaviours to women and we reward men for exhibiting those behaviours because when men behave in feminine ways, they have traditionally feminine, as in having other traits, they're traditionally punished for not manning up, for acting like a woman or being a girl. Um, and when women display traits that are typically seen as masculine, they're also, even though they do that because they know it's the behaviour that gets rewarded and leads to the top job, um, they're also punished for those behaviours. They get called bitches and ball breakers. It's very gendered language. Mm. So actually what we need to do is recognise that both men and women have the capacity for all of these traits and all of these behaviours and it's not owned by one gender and we should actually recognise that. But we also need to think about what kind of traits we want in leaders. And what the evidence shows is that really good leaders, effective leaders that run inclusive organisations that are productive and um, creative and are able to solve problems, they need to have capabilities that are, are not one or the other. They are... Um, it's a new type of leadership. It's an mm. inclusive leader is a leader that treats people with dignity and respect no matter who they are. It's a leader that has a clear vision of the future um, and clearly articulates expectations without bullying people, um, that is able to make decisions but in the process is consultative and collaborative in coming up with those decisions. These sorts of skills are not... Um, related to either gender and they are the skills and the traits and the behaviours that are seen to produce the best outcomes in business. And so it should actually be a win-win for both women and for men. A lot of men have been left out of the leadership picture as well because they haven't mm. fit that na that very narrow um, idea of what a leader means. And in some cases, it can have really quite devastating consequences for them in terms of how they see them see themselves, and how they and how the narrow definition of masculinity what what sort of an impact that has on their own identity and the sort of reckoning that a lot of men have to have around that, because I don't think it's um, a coincidence that we see really. Um, large statistics in the area of men's mental health and well-being being problematic, mm. male suicide, um, relationship breakdowns, all these things are connected. Um, mm. Hostile workplaces, workplaces that are built on high levels of aggression don't lead to great outcomes for human beings. We're all fragile in the end. Oftentimes when we see um, things balance out, we, we think, see things that are imbalanced come into balance. Oftentimes, if they're out of balance, they'll often go to the other end of the spectrum and backwards and forwards until there's a happy medium that is found. And something that's been you know, talked about, I think, quite um, at a, quite a, a popular level or a media level anyways, this concept of toxic mas masculinity um, and then this judgment around what's healthy masculinity, what's toxic masculinity. Um, what I've seen in certain conversations, especially in social media, where you know gender equality is being discussed, is in some cases almost a reverse in the polarity. Where, like, I, I wouldn't go as far as to say toxic f femininity, but it's yep. like you you see what I would refer to as toxic behaviour coming from women that could only be described as unhealthy because it's yep. so far beyond what would be considered yep. a balance in the in the equation. Yeah, and is that's that really. That yeah, it's unhelpful. Look, stay yeah. away from social media if you want a rational discourse <laughs> around this. Yeah. But I think the other problem with that is that social media forces us to simplify problems. And these yeah. conversations are actually really, really complex and you can't yeah. do it in 125 characters. And it, yeah. it, it makes conversations reductive. And what happens is people are sparring off each other. Look, toxic masculinity as it's framed – um, is unhealthy behaviour that leads to really bad outcomes for women and for men. Um, it's the reason that we have like highly um, toxic masculine behaviours that lead to things like violence um, and aggression. I mean, that's not good for anyone. I mean, women are 
disproportionate victims of gendered violence um, and, you know, the levels of um, the crime rate against women in the domestic violence space is still really significant. We have um, over one woman who dies at the hand of her domestic partner or ex-partner every week. We have, um, you know, every day, I think it's every six minutes, there's a police call that's that's made due to domestic or family violence. On the other wow. side of the equation, men are the biggest victims of violent crime, um, usually at the hands of other men. Mm. So there is something in the culture that leads to men's violence, which is actually a problem that needs to be discussed, whether that violence is directed towards other men, towards women or towards themselves, um, is really problematic. And I think that it does it's not helpful to any for anyone to say to back people into corners and to say, oh well, all men are toxic, you know, have mm. display toxic masculine behaviour. That's rubbish. You should never say all men or all women. Um, but it is true that there are issues around um, some types of extreme masculine behaviour that do lead to violence. But mm. it's a much more nuanced um, nuanced discussion. It needs to be a more nuanced discussion than the way it's currently had because it just people just get backed into corners and no one backs down. It, it's, it's ugly. Ends up being messy. I've always been curious about the divorce dynamics, and I'm not sure if, if you've researched this historically, but I've always been a little bit curious as to um, how much divorce has played into some of the dynamics that we're play, seeing play out right now. And I'll talk historically, because I know up until the 1940s, 1950s, divorce wasn't common, and maybe even the 1960s and, and beyond. And then all, you know, around the 1950s and 60s, divorce rates started to, to skyrocket as people became more comfortable with the idea of separating and remarrying, you know, as we kind of dissolved the hold that maybe some of the the religions held on culture at large. But then we we entered this realm where a lot of um, children were being brought up in many cases by by just the woman and in some cases by a woman that may have been wronged by a man. Um, and, you know, I, I remember having this conversation because I, I grew up with a single mum and I remember having this conversation with other with other friends at the time, like in my teenage years, where the mums were, you know, literally telling their their teenage daughters, "You need to be more like the. You need to learn how to look after yourself. You need to learn how to be more like. You know, what I was hearing is, you need to be more like men." Mm. And then I'd hear them turn it to me, and you, they'd say things like, "Well, you need to be more sensitive to women." And I almost saw like playing out, you know, in a range of different family scenarios where you would have this matriarch of the family. That was trying to protect her, her 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 children, but in one respect she was telling the women to become more like men, and in the other respect she was telling men to become more more like women. And I wonder, I often wonder if 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 that done at scale can create levels of confusion around, you know, identity as to who we really are at the core and how we should be showing up. Because I because oftentimes I look at certain behaviours and I'm confused because I look and I go, why the why the why would you do that? That doesn't. There's no rationale behind that level of bias. There's no rationale behind that perspective, yet some people buy into it historically for a whole range of reasons. I'm just curious if this is one that has ever come across your radar. I don't think you can blame um, parents for trying to pass on lessons that they think will be useful for their children because not. their life experience has taught yep. them, um, especially if, you, if you're a woman who's a single parent and you're struggling, um, then you would absolutely want to teach your children the importance of being economically independent. I think everyone should learn how to be economically independent. Um, the divorcing is interesting. I mean, divorces started to become more frequent once no-fault divorce was passed in law. Before that was passed in the 70s, I believe, um, women had to demonstrate that some marital that the marital contract had been breached, infidelity, um, flittering away of money. Um, once that changed, and once women were able to access the workplace, so it wasn't until the seventies that um, married women were allowed to retain their jobs, um, or they were able to go back to work after pregnancy. So women, women who'd previously been excluded from the workplace, were all of a sudden able to. Be in the workplace, and economic, what economic independence does is enable you to not have to stay in a relationship that's not working. There were limited choices and options for women prior to no-fault divorce. 
Um, so that's one thing that can explain why um, divorce numbers increase. That previously, very unhappy mm. marriages were able to mm. separate and go their way. What's also so when did that no-fault law come in? That was in oh, the 70s, look, I have to look up the exact year. Okay, no, that's fine. It, it's, it came it's, in, it's but it was matter. a really significant turning yeah. point in Australia and a really good way forward for women to be able to um, exit marriages that were um, violent or abusive. The interesting thing is that um, we did a piece of work a few years ago called Engaging Men on Gender Equality, where we looked at all the um, research on men and relationships, and we were able to ascertain that men who are in relationships, heterosexual men who are in relationships with women um, that were more feminist type relationships in the sense that there was there was less of a defined role about what men do and what women do. They were more likely to be relationships that succeeded. Um, relationships where there are very narrow definitions of what men do and what women do um, are less likely, are more likely to end in divorce. Which and is I, what is considered traditional marriage in my respect. A respects. traditional marriage. Yeah. And it's not hard to extrapolate why. When roles are divided within a couple situation, and if those roles are unfair, um, resentment can build. Mm. Um, we certainly know from the data that we've produced that even when women work the same number of hours as their partner in a heterosexual relationship, they still do the majority of the housework and the childcare outside of usual childcare hours. That's not a conducive scenario for a loving relationship that's likely to lead mm. to a lot of resentment. And that even when men do take on um, childcare roles or caring roles, they tend to do more of the high visibility roles, taking and dropping kids off at birthday parties, um, taking them to sport, taking them to the, getting them out of the house so that the woman can focus on doing housework. So the man gets to have, I'm generalising here, um, time at the park with the kids and while the woman's busy doing all the laundry, which is drudgery. That's not conducive for over, over a long period of time. That can set up hostility, I, I would imagine. Um, at the same time, men are denied in large part the wonderfulness of being a really mm. active parent. The role, the role as defined by them and as, as workplaces have, you know, very few workplaces are really supportive of men um, taking on primary caring roles. That's starting to change now and it's important that it does change because men being excluded from the home environment and from the caring environment narrows their identity in, mm -hmm. in a really limited area and it denies them the opportunity to build really satisfying relationships with their children. And you'll often. And also, hear, would you would you would you also agree that, that it doesn't give them the opportunity to learn how to relate in a more soft, gentle, intimate course. way, which essentially is going to be a healthier way to relate to human beings. Of course, whenever we've done research in flexible work, and we, the struggle for women has always been, I need flexible work because I'm looking after children and having to supplement the family income, and the struggle for men has always been, I really want to spend more time with my family. Mm. And I'm not allowed. And when I men that do spend more time with their family, their masculinity gets questioned. Um, this is not healthy for men and it's not great for families. We know from Northern European studies where there's um, a statutory imposition that parental leave is equally shared between both partners and where the government takes um, treats childcare the same way that we treat public education, that the children of those relationships have much richer um, relationships with their fathers and it has a really profound positive impact, especially on young men. Um, mm. as they grow up with really close relationships with their dads. And I think we should do everything we can to do away with these traditional ideas of what men and women should do and provide opportunities for men and women to work out how do they want to run their family, what makes the most sense for them in an ideal world, and let's support that because the outcomes 
for men, for women and for children are really positive. When we talk gender equality, most people in most cases will focus in and narrow in on 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 the female perspective and what's going on for most women, which is in many respects incredibly fair based on hist- historically how we got here. But one area of gender equality that is, seems to be getting increasing levels of attention is gender equality in the in the realm of divorce, uh, in the realm of you know paternity and, and care. Um, you know, I know as as a single dad myself, um, when I went through the process of uh, divorce, I was terrified. Uh, as someone who has a very high value on family, very high value on being a father, very high value on, you know, being able to have my son a- as much as possible. But I became acutely aware that I didn't have anywhere near the rights that I thought I would have as a as a parent. Um, and in many respects, it was going to be up to. And I'm, thankfully, I've got an incredible ex-wife, and we and we worked through it beautifully. But there was still that fear that, mm. oh, holy shit, I don't have really many yeah. rights here because if mm. if I had married someone who perhaps had an alternative perspective on the exit of our relationship, I may not have been able to see very much of my son at all. And not because I'm not a, I'm not a good yeah. person, but because that's just how the laws are set up. How, how do we approach that in, in, in a way that, you know, starts the conversation to move things in a direction where it is considered more acceptable for men, you know, to be included in that conversation around paternity and that I think I think care. it starts the minute a baby is born. I think that um, dad's are entitled to have um, the right to parental leave in a work setting, the right to um, be an active part of their child's life. Children have the right to Mm. um, have access to their parents, both of them, if they're lucky enough to have two parents um, and that those two parents are engaged and want to be present because we, we do know that there are single parent families where there's a very absent parent and, and that yep. absent parent's made a choice to be absent. But where the parent has not made a choice to be absent and they want to be part of a child's life, I think that we should always come from a child-centred um vision of what is in the best interest of that child and what is in the best interest of that child is a relationship with with two loving parents. Um, Now, I'm sure you'd agree that's common sense, but common sense isn't always common practice. And oftentimes the law is what people lean on. Yeah, the the law is what people lean on. So do you see there being a potential shift in the legislation and, and, and the legal perspective when it comes to, let's just say, the, the, the dynamic when it in comes to In the family to court, yeah. yeah. I think there's a government inquiry at the moment. There's a Senate inquiry into the way the family court works. Unfortunately, it's being partly led by Pauline Hanson who oh, has um, – yeah has got a very skewed idea of, I mean, she's made comments such as women make up domestic violence complaints so that their partners don't get access to their children. So I think when you've got a politician who has got that kind of bias already in their head and they're leading a Senate inquiry, that's a bit problematic. But Mm. I think we should always look at our laws. Um, A law is only ever as good as the environment in which it was constructed and it's made up of... Um, the political environment at the time, the social norms and the mores that people accept, and then a body of common law is built up which reflects the you know the, the judgments made by individual judges. And laws are not perfect, and they should always be reviewed and reflected to reflect, the current zeitgeist. If a law, if laws around parenting were created ten years ago, they need to be reviewed today because parenting has moved on, and mm. our expectation of of men and women as parents has moved on. And certainly, women's economic participation in the workplace, men's greater participation at home, um, is has created a different environment than when some laws were initially set up. I mean, I haven't had that much to do with family law. I mean, my expertise yep. really is from a workplace perspective. Um, but I definitely think that laws need to be um, constantly updated and to reflect the current you know, what's expected in the current times. Mm. And let's maybe move it into the workplace because that's obviously where your, your expertise is it really lays. Um, when we look at gender equality, at what point does gender equality become a threat to performance when people are trying to put a, a person of a, per, a specific sex in a position 
just to be seen as to be gender equal when in the reality they're maybe putting a lesser qualified, lesser skilled, lesser abled person, which could actually potentially threaten the economic viability of the organization itself. How do you balance that out in order to maintain that equilibrium? Well, I think um, what's what's important to understand is that there's an assumption currently that everyone that's appointed to a position of leadership or um, power or is paid well is there entirely because of their merit. Um, people get to positions of power for all in all sorts of manners. Um, mm-hmm. People who have privilege um, are much more likely to be in significant positions of power. I don't think you can look at Australian leadership and say every single person who is there, either running a company, on the board of a company or in politics, is there entirely because they're the best person to be there. Yeah, I so I think we firstly agree. have to challenge the idea that everyone yeah. who is there is there because of merit. The other mm-hmm. assumption that we need to challenge is that a woman is taking a job from a man because inherent in that assumption is the idea that that position – Um, that a man is already entitled to that position. And actually, a position shouldn't have any gender unless, you know, you're an actor or a model or um, your gender is absolutely implicit in in a position. So, So a position doesn't actually have a gender. So the idea that um, women's economic participation participation is happening at the expense of men is something we need to challenge because we're making the assumption then that the job jobs are owned by men and women are coming in to take them away. Okay. I've heard this so many times and I always push back on it because I usually ask people for examples of can you please point out when you've seen a um, – I've never seen a non-meritous um, woman being appointed to a position over – a more qualified and better um, experienced man. I've never actually seen it. What I have seen is the perception that this man is more deserving of it because he's part of the club, he's one of the boys, um, and that the woman's an outsider. So we're taking a punt and a risk. Men get promoted on their potential and women get promoted on their past performance. And whenever you're talking about potential, it's limitless. And people um, fall into natural biases like affinity biases. If the group of people making the decision about who should join the group are a group of people who all look alike, and in Australia, our leadership um, team still look pretty white, Anglo-Celtic, straight, able-bodied males. So you naturally um, rate people higher if they are more like you. Is that actually a non-biased assessment of someone's capability? No. There's always biases that are in there. So um, I would say that to to people. I also think it's important to recognise that in order to try and counter the idea that women who lack merit are getting jobs and um, being promoted at the expense of men. I'd ask people to reflect on how you define what makes what consists of merit. Is it about because we know that women are actually better educated than men now in Australia. We are we have the highest level of educational attainment for women anywhere in the OECD. Girls perform exceptionally well at school and at university. We know it's not a question of intelligence. Um, yes, it's true that women tend to dominate certain types of industries and there are other industries like Um, STEM careers, engineering, those sorts of professions that are more dominated by men. It is harder to find women in those industries, just like it's harder to find men in nursing. Um, But the difference is that when women enter male-dominated professions, they really struggle to get ahead. When men enter female-dominated professions, um, there's a phenomenon called the glass lift where they elevate to the top very, very quickly. And we see this in the healthcare sector, we see it in hairdressing, we see it in fashion, we see it in food, all the professions where women have tended to dominate teaching, um, men rise to the top very, very quickly. Why is that? 
So I actually think when we hear people make statements like this, we need to challenge the assumptions that they are based on. Of course, there could be specific examples where reverse discrimination has taken place. But as a rule, if that was true, we would see equal numbers of men and women in power, and we don't. Mm. There are less than 5% of CEOs of the ASX um, 500 organisations are made up of women, less than 28% of board directors on the ASX are made up of women, and these are public listed companies. These are, these are the companies where gender equality is seen as a um, – a strategic objective. It's much worse in other in other kinds of organisations. There's still a gender pay gap. Um, violence and harassment rates against women are still quite rife. So we haven't in any way achieved equality, let alone reverse discrimination. So the feeling of oppression that sometimes gets projected is actually a perception. It's not a reality. It doesn't. Mm. It, there are, there's no data that supports that. Maybe I, maybe I was a little bit naive because I, I proposed that as a gender neutral scenario, um, and obviously okay. it went in in a, in the direction that it did, which is, is is completely okay. But and again, maybe this is my my naivete where if there is a genuine situation where you do where you are put in a position where you do have to select someone, and there is a skills gap. Um, cause I've actually, I've had conversations cause obviously I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, and a range of different levels. <clears throat> and this is, I'll, and to, to be fair to your, to your point, it's very rare for reverse, um, for it to be on the reverse, but it does happen from time to time. And I'm just curious in those scenarios, you know, how is, how is it best dealt with in a way that, you know, um, mitigates the, the risk for the company, but also enables everyone to have the same level playing field. Well, I'm not really worried about it because if you if you tally it all up, most of the opportunities are given to men. Um, and we know that by looking at all of the appointments that are made across leadership all across the country in mm. politics, um, in government, and we even know with entrepreneurs, getting um, access to funding um, is much harder for female entrepreneurs. So I, I'm not particular. If there are individual circumstances where an untalented um, woman gets appointed, or an un, or, or I lesser think talented. a lesser talented person. Um, I think you've got to set people up for success. You've got to look mm. at what your processes are like in terms of – there's probably a flaw in your recruitment if that has happened. Mm. Um, really good recruitment practices mean that you analyse a job and you look at what the inherent requirements are of that job um, without reference to someone's gender or culture, age or whatever. You advertise a position using gender-neutral language. You have a panel of – um, people who are diverse, so you don't just have the same type of people doing the interviews. And then if you happen to decide that, okay, we're going to bring someone on and they're really different to everybody else, um, then you have to try and set that person up for success because it's very easy to fail um, because people are making assessments on your capability based on what historically has been valued in an organisation. And if you're always mm. looking to the past to determine the value of an individual, then the past is not full of very diverse people. So you'll always run into problems. My recommendation would be try and make sure you have really um, clear and bias, as bias-free as you can, recruitment processes, onboarding processes, and that you identify talent um, with respect to actual job requirements, but try to be open-minded about what those job requirements are. Mm. Like, and again, I'm, 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 I'm starting to think I'm a little bit naive in this space, although I thought I, I had a, like at least a mild level of exposure to it. But I, I'm starting to reflect on myself and go, I think I'm actually there's a there's a very high probability that I actually display gender bias in my company. Um, you know, I was brought up by a single mum. I would say more than 50, 60% of my leaders in my organization are female. 
all of the highest paid people in my organization, all of the top five people in my organization are all female in terms of top paid. Um, and when I reflect, because I'm listening to you talking, I'm like, fuck, maybe, I'm, maybe I've got reverse sexism. Like I'm literally thinking that way and I'm open to this conversation. But I look in the, in the organization now and go, yeah, we have a disproportionate representation of female talent in our organization. Um, and I ask myself the question as with, as with why? And look, there's a number of an answers and most of these will be anecdotal, but I'm, I'm curious to explore it with you if you're open um, because I'm, I'm interested in that opposite and that, that reflection of the perspective. I actually, and again, maybe this makes me sexist, but I actually find it easier to work with women. And I'm not sure if this is because I was brought up mm. in a very highly, you know, a very feminine environment, but I typically find them better communicators, more emotionally regulated, uh, in most cases have significantly more humility and significantly less ego. Um, and they're just in most cases easier to be around and work with. Now, is, is that gender bias? Look, the, probably the better question, though, I mean, it could be, but the better question is the reason there's a focus on gender equality in terms of trying to get more women into positions of power is because there's a yeah. historical imbalance and there's a historical, we don't have a, yeah. no question. So, so given that it's the reverse is not an issue. I don't really think you need to worry about it. If you yeah. were, if we, you were in an economy where men were not represented in power, where they didn't have access to, um, where they, they they fared worse economically than women, um, and where where they were excluded from sort of leadership clubs, where there was a girls club and they were excluded from that, then yeah, I would say, you know, you're part of the problem. You need to look at your workplace and try and make mm -hmm. sure you get more men in there to have the same opportunities as women. But given that across the whole economy, we're trying to redress a historical mm. um, imbalance. I think that when there are organisations who are really, you know, female focused and positive, I actually think it's a good thing. I never set out to do it. It just happened that. No, it just and you probably do though. have. You probably do have, but we know unconscious bias. Everybody has bias. If, Everybody yeah, has we, bias. We all have yeah. them, and they're they are a product of our generation and our geography. So, um, what you'll find is that people in different parts of the world have similar kinds of biases, and the first seven years of your life really seriously informs that. So it's no wonder that if you were raised um, in a matriarchal family environment that you've then got the opinion that women are great at leadership because you've seen your mother leading a family, um, that women are really good decision makers because you saw your mother making all the big family decisions. So it, it's it makes sense to me that you would have those um, that, that opinion. Now, that is unusual. Most people in Australia mm. are not were not raised in single parent families. They are a significant family group, um, yep. but they're still they're not the dominant family group. The dominant family group still are dual parent families, um, and because of the traditional roles men and women pay, play, most people, including myself, have unconscious biases that weight men that correlate men more strongly with leadership and women more strongly with nurturing, and. Those, unless you challenge your biases, they will just automatically, you know, they will automatically um, be allowed to help inform your decisions. Um, so, so it's probably true that you have some bias in favour of women yeah. and their multitude of talents. And and I'm I've just never looked at it as a bias. I've always just been quite a proponent of, uh, you know, the the feminine way and. I guess this kind of leads to a bigger question and maybe I'm opening Pandora's box here at the wrong time of the conversation, but I remember coming across some historical information going back. It was quite a, a number of centuries ago where there was almost like a, um, it was around the time where women were quite revered. I think this was before um, uh, certain segments of religion came to, to be born. And then there was this almost like this um, extermination where women were considered to be a threat. And there was a period of time where women were vilified, you know, there was witch hunts. Um, and if, if my memory serves me correct, there were a number of women in a range of different areas around the world that were literally exterminated based on their gender uh, and the threat that they were considered to have when it came to governance, when it came to power. Um, and again, I'm not sure if I'm opening up something here that's this, that, that, that is beyond me, 
as I said, this is quite anecdotal. But what I do see, looking at that historical information, whether I'm right or factual otherwise, or I'm just recalling information that's, as I said, anecdotal and maybe not as correct as I, I, it could be. But even today, I look at the way many men treat women and they treat them like a threat. And I, I, for the life of me, and again, maybe this comes down to my upbringing, I don't understand it. Like to me, I see women holding an incredible power in their ability to synergize, and also men, men and women, but I see women holding a particular level of power energetically um, um, based on you know many factors of their, of their biology, but also their energy to be able to imp- because they say, and I know this is an old anecdote, behind every great man is a great woman, but there's so much historical information to say that would be true. Like even, I don't know if you're familiar with the text, uh, Think and Grow Rich, it was written by Napoleon Hill. Uh, and he wrote that back in, 19, he, spent, he started writing in 1900, it was finished in 1927, published in 1932. And he was a, um, a, an author that was given access to the 500 wealthiest people at the time. Um, it was given access to them by, um, oh gosh, what was the guy's name? The steel magnate. Um, if the life of me, uh, can't think of it, um, Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie gave Napoleon access to the 500 wealthiest humans at that time. Now, at the time, all those 500 human beings were men. But what was interesting in the research that he did, he wanted to find out all the characteristics that they shared. And one of the characteristics that he identified, now, please bear with me here, it was a characteristic that he, he labeled as sex transmutation. But when you, when you delved into the description of what he was talking about, he was talking about that behind every great man that had built enormous wealth, there was a female entity, there was a female form that created a level of charge, a level of inspiration, a level of you know, desire, as you might call it, to go out and do something great. And, you know, and, and we see this on both sides of the equation, but me personally, I've experienced this many times with, with women, whereby every now and then a woman comes into your life and they go, oh my God, like it's, it creates this force. And so from your perspective, and maybe this is a little esoteric and maybe I'm going too far here, but from all of your experiences, why do you think men in some respects, especially in the leadership space, find women so threatening? That's a really good question. Um, I think because this isn't just a problem with the last twenty no, years. This seems no, to me oh this gosh. is going on for well, hundreds of years. If you if you um, wanted to know everything you could about the history of the world, and you you relied on um, the texts that were written, either either religious texts or even the you know documentation by philosophers, you would think mm-hmm. that women played a very that women were almost invisible in history. Um, And that's, of course, not possible. Society couldn't have progressed forward without both men and women working together. Um, But in terms of how it's been documented, the sorts of stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves, um, it's fairly new that we're starting to tell female stories. And we know female stories are just as interesting as men's stories. So I think it's important to know that we only know what we know about history because of what's been recorded. And if women's experiences haven't been recorded, then they've been lost to history. It's also true that um, a lot of our society, depending on what part of the world you're in and which era, um, has been defined by a patriarchy. And within that, um, even our Western civilization, I mean, women have only been able to vote for just over 100 years. You know, in Jane Austen's time, women still weren't able to own property unless they had a title. So we're talking about very recent history where women have got the sorts of rights where they can be independent. Other than other than that, they were defined by either their father or their husband. Um, and this transaction happens, you know, it still happens today at marriage, the transfer of the, the, the you know, the ownership of the woman from the husband to the, I'm, I'm using the word ownership loosely, it. but we see it in women's, yep. even in women's names, women aren't even entitled to their own name from their birth to their death, that it's transient. You are of your father until you are of your husband. Oh, women are starting to challenge that now, mm. um, but it's very symbolic of how history has regarded women over time. And I think that's a massive legacy and for mm. people to, to all of a sudden change their way of thinking, um, it actually requires a level of insight that a lot of people haven't even thought about. You just accept that until someone challenges. And when someone challenges it, like 
feminist you know, first wave, second wave. We're now in third wave feminism. They're seen as troublemakers, as difficult women. But actually, um, we're just challenging existing norms. Why can't a woman be entitled to, ma- I mean, she can now legally maintain her name from her birth to her death, the name she was given at birth. Why does it have to transfer power? Um, why is it that when there's a child, there's no conversation about the surname of that child unless you're in a same-sex couple where gender roles are then disbanded and people enter into an honest conversation about what will be the name, the surname of this child. Um, so something is, is it, it's almost invisible and yet it's so significant and I think it's really symbolic of um, – the way women's power is perceived, that's actually sometimes with some men seen as quite threatening. Mm. And I struggle to understand why. And the only explanation that sociologists can come up with is that when you're accustomed to a certain level amount of power and privilege, any attack on that power and privilege feels threatening and it feels like oppression. So, um, I can imagine that that's probably at play. It's probably true to say that people who do end up becoming very successful and end up running countries or running big companies, there's probably something of the egomaniac in them um, and they probably have a heightened sense of um, a threat of someone trying to sort of come in on their authority as well. So it might be a combination of a historical legacy as well as the personality types of people who um, rise to really high levels of power. It seems to me like we're unravelling uh, centuries of dysfunction um, in the male-female dynamic. So is it fair to say that there's a level of patience that's required for us to trans because you know quite rightly we've done an enormous amount of change in a very short period of time when you look at the historical block that we're coming off the back of um so things are actually moving quite quickly but for some they would say it's not moving fast enough and for some i would agree and for others i'd say look we've come a long way in a very short period of time so how important is it during this process to maintain a level of patience as we navigate the change but at the same time apply the level of pressure that's required to ensure that that change keeps happening I think it depends on who you are. Um, The organisation that I run, I I actually have a foot in two camps. I run the Diversity Council Australia and it's our job to be patient and to bring people along the journey, both men and women together to a new world of work. Um, But I also sit on the board of Amnesty International and that's all about calling out behaviour and being... um, um, wanting change now, wanting things to happen right now and not not being frightened of the reaction or the retaliation, standing up to the status quo. So if your role is to be an agitator, then be an agitator. Um, in the business world, I think it makes more sense to bring people with you um, mm. because you've got to work together to run the economy. I also think in a family, in a small scale environment, a less adversarial approach, um, a combined approach of moving together um, is also, if you can make that work, really, really helpful. I think it depends on where you are. There are roles for agitators and activists and there are roles for collaborators and people who want to bring people together. If you're running a country, Mm. it's your job to bring people together. Um, if you're, you know, a, a human rights lawyer, it's your your job to to call people out, or an artist, um, a creator, a writer, a painter, a singer. Um, those people have got an incredible ability to 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 highlight injustice and to reflect back on the world things that are wrong, and they can mm. do a lot of good in moving things forward. So. Um, I just think it depends on who you are. I think if you're doing podcasts, it's a really good opportunity to agitate um, Mm. and call out things that need to change. That's a really, really good response. And knowing your personality and where you fit in that as well. Mm. Um, The the Me Too movement, um, obviously that's gained a lot of momentum and a lot of steam. Uh, It polarizes people on both sides of the equation. Where do do you sit on on the the Me Too movement and its effectiveness? Yeah. Well, its effectiveness is another thing altogether. In theory, as a movement, it was long overdue. Um, Calling out really, really powerful men for extraordinary despicable behaviour was necessary. 
and it's long overdue. And I think it was really, really important that, you know, certain behaviours and certain men who had a pattern of predatory behaviour were called out. Unfortunately, how much has, have things changed? Only time will tell. Um, I obviously, I'm cognizant of the fact that there's a feeling with the Me Too movement that all men are fair game and that they're frightened of how they w- will interact with women. Um, but I'm here to reassure men that it's very, very rare for for women to make um, dishonest claims around sexual violence or sexual harassment. The Human Rights Commission, which is our body in Australia that looks at it, it's a very minuscule proportion of complaints that are ever found to be vexatious. The opposite is actually true, that most people don't raise issues, whether they're men or women, that it actually takes a lot of courage to come out against someone and say, this happened to me and um, I want it on the record. So it's actually more likely that we're still massively underreporting harassment and abuse um, against women, but also um, against men. And that the very, very small number of vexatious or made up stories shouldn't deter us from trying to move in the right direction. Unfortunately, there will always be um, people who are acting in a dishonest way, but that's that's very minor. We don't set up laws for the minority. We do it for the majority. We don't mm. have, um, yeah, so, so that's what I would say to that. I think Me Too is important that we don't lose that momentum and that we have a safe space for people to be able to say, actually, you know, this behaviour that I've been putting up with for years and years, that's not okay. And I now finally feel like I can say something because usually only certain types of people have had the bravery to be able to do Mm. that because the implications have been massive for them. Do you see the Me Too movement broadening into both masculine issues and fem- uh, uh, just apart from feminine issues? Or do you see a He Too movement potentially gaining momentum? Because I remember looking at some of the figures around, you know, the reverse. And I know it's nowhere near what it is with with women, but I know that there's still a percentage of men out there that do experience levels of abuse, both emotional and mental, do experience levels of harassment um, and do experience l- levels of, obviously not to the degree, but do you ever see that coming back in the other direction where you start seeing more men coming forward to share their experiences and their stories? I hope anyone, man or woman, feels safe yeah. enough to come forward and call out really bad behaviour. But you've got to be honest here and recognise that most sexual predatory behaviour is perpetrated by men. That's mm. that's um, borne out in all the crime statistics. It's borne out in all the... Um, statistics that are reported to not just the police but to um, and me too is about sexual predation. Does that in itself create so much noise whereby the where there are innocent parties on the on the on the opposite sex who are the minority in that respect who in some respects get their lives either you know compromised or destroyed how how do we keep I guess it's a it's an open-ended question how do we keep a level of 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 equality in that conversation to make sure that we're not in some cases because again i've seen it's what like in in some respects it's one it's a blanket approach and if a a man has been a man has been accused it's it's guilty before you know guilt what is it called guilty before proven innocent um how do we manage that that dialogue because we've seen it happen in the public where someone will get called out and it's trial by social media you know and often after the fact, it's found out that it's it's an it's just a false accusation, but it's too late. That person's well, that, life has been destroyed. True. Their marriage has been destroyed. Their business yeah. has been destroyed. We need to be very careful about the court of public opinion. Um, there, there are reasons why um, courts and police matters are run the way they're run, um, mm. to be run without prejudice, to give everyone deserves a, a fair trial. Um, everyone has a right to be represented, no matter how despicable their crimes are, that their alleged crimes are. Media reporting is really important here. Um, social media platforms have a responsibility as well to um, to ensure that that they're not um, a party to an injustice. Um, but I think. I still think we have to realise that this is still highly unusual and very rare. 
that mm. most of the people who've been found to have had appalling behaviour in the Me Too movement have actually had appalling behaviour in mm. the Me Too movement, no, and they've been and, rightly called out. But I, I, I I, we, can, we should never, we should never yeah. um, take away the presumption of innocence from anyone or their right to a fair trial. And to echo that, especially just because they're the minority, and which kind of you know is 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 where most people fall victim to their situation because well I'm a minority I I can't get help I'm a minority yeah. I don't matter. Um, in terms of examples of great female leadership, I've got someone in mind, but I'm curious to know from your perspective, someone who you see who's perhaps either very visible nationally or international on the global stage. When you look around the world right now, what female leaders give you hope? When you go, wow, that's that's really how I'd like to see it being done. That's what I want to see coming through. Look, it, what's been interesting with the COVID-19 pandemic is um, to have a look around the world and see how when females have led countries versus when men have led countries about how their approach has been a little bit different. Um, certainly, the I think it was the... Prime Minister of Finland ran a kids' press conference because she recognised that children were really scared um, because of the pandemic. I mean, that's just – that's a lovely wow. thing for a wow. female leader to do. And I don't think you can go past people like um, – Jacinda Ardern, mm. and on the other side of politics, Angela Merkel, who she's a, a Christian conservative, um, but there's no hiding away from the fact that she's got a PhD in quantum physics. She's a woman driven <laughs> by by evidence and by yeah. um, and by science, which is why she's on you know what I would consider the right side of of the climate debate, for example. So I think that there are a lot of women. I think. The, what sets a good leader apart from a great leader is their authenticity. And I think mm. when we saw Jacinda Ardern after the Christchurch um, event, her humanity really shone through. You can't fake that. When we see leaders who we know they don't really mean it or they, they're just showing up and shaking hands for the sake of it, um, but you can tell when someone's really moved or really touched by something. And we saw that, um, we do see that routinely with Jacinda Ardern. And I think we've seen it even in some of our leaders in the past. I certainly felt, for example, when Kevin Rudd gave the apology to the Stolen Generation, that was a really emotional, sincere, mm. no matter what you think of Kevin Rudd, that yeah. was a really emotional, genuine, sincere moment when you saw John Howard stand up to um, people who wanted to keep their guns, no matter what you think of John Howard and his politics, that was a really sincere, genuine moment of leadership. When you saw Julia Gillard call the Royal Commission into child um, sexual abuse in institutions, another great moment. Leaders are at their best when they're authentic, when they're not playing to a poll, when they're not worried about focus groups and when they're just connecting with people um, as human beings. And it's up to us as um, people who vote them in to vote in people who we think are authentic um, and who have good hearts that want to take the country in the right direction. So, but the people I admire in terms of strong leaders um, tend to be more, I mean, I admire all sorts of different politicians. I'm always worried about <laughs> calling someone out because you never know when they're going to fall from grace. Um, <laughs> but I, They're human, right? They're, yeah, but I... I've, I actually, I'm someone who's very deeply connected to, um, I'm very inspired by the world of fiction and I'm, I'm very passionate about um, certain genres, one of them being science fantasy and science fiction. I've got three daughters and I've always raised them on a diet of science fantasy and science fiction. They are unbelievable mediums that examine good versus evil, and they usually fo they usually follow a hero's arc: Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, The Hunger Games, and that hero is constantly faced with moral decisions to make in their pursuit of a better world, and of course, the hero always makes the bravest decision. But I've always looked to fiction. To, you, you can always find 
a story and because everything's possible in fiction and you don't have limits and so you can find wonderful ins- inspirational stories and journeys to look to to help inform your decision what writers good novelists can do is um look at a person not as a cartoon cutout but as a real three de- three dimensional individual um, and present them with obstacles and then watch them make decisions. And I, I love doing that and I certainly every night retreat into a world of fiction and fall in love with heroes and heroines all the time. And it would appear that science fiction, even science fantasy, is actually at some point going to be moved into the non-fiction section. <laughs> possibly, <laughs> quite um, possibly. And hopefully we'll have ethical people making those decisions. Yeah, definitely, indeed. Lisa, I've got to say, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I um, when, when I first sat down with the producers, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure where this will go, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much it's a uh, for, for entertaining me and maybe some of my questions, which are a little bit uh, less well-formed. But yeah, I really appreciate the insights and the perspectives that you've shared today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been wonderful. So where can people find out more about you? Um, They can go to the Diversity Council Australia website, www.dca.org.au. Fantastic. Lisa, thank you again, uh, and I hope at some point we can connect again in the future. This episode was brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for business. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the flesh. Share this podcast with your friends and drop me a review on iTunes. I would love to hear what you guys think and also let you know that your comments help make sure that we keep producing killer content just like this. And if you'd like to stay up to date with all of my movements, upcoming podcasts, events, and much more, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com, and also check us out on all social media on the handle at Kerwin Ray. Thanks for joining us.